good to be together this morning. Grateful always for the opportunity to open God's Word and gain wisdom and instruction and encouragement as we seek to navigate through the difficult passages of our own lives and uh, to see where God encourages us to know that He is there. And by faith, we can continue to do our part in, in being faithful to His direction uh, we can safely reach our own destinations. And I always found this particular section of Scripture to be so encouraging in, in, in a, a few ways. One, in that it, it's such an accurate description uh, of where we may not be ourselves in, in, in a physical vessel that's being thrown about by waves that are in the middle of an ocean or a sea somewhere, but we may very well feel that way at times. It may feel that our life is just uh, being torn apart or, or just thrown about in, in a number of different ways, and we feel we're totally incapable of stopping the direction. And, and I've always felt that this description of what the sailors were, were facing is such um, an accurate description and a parallel in many ways of sometimes what we go through in our own lives, especially when it, notice it says in verse 15 of Acts chapter 27, it says that when the ship was caught in it, and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. I feel sometimes that's the only thing we can do. Sometimes it feels like the only thing I can do, I can't stop the direction. I, I, I would do anything to change it, but it seems that this is the course of direction. And I'm caught in it. And I just need to let myself be driven along. And yet even as we're trying to, to find some safety or some sense of it, it seems that even here, notice that they, they kept trying to, to, to steady the boat, to steady the ship. But nothing they did helped. It says in verse 16, running under the shelter of a small island called Claudia, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. And after they had hoisted it up and they used supporting cables and undergirding the ship and fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of the surf, they let down the sea anchor, and in this way let themselves be driven along. The next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Sometimes we feel like the same way where we don't know anything to do, but just maybe lighten the load somewhere, just toss everything overboard, anything you can, get your hands on, maybe this will make it better. Lighten uh, what, 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 what's being burdened on me, and sometimes that doesn't help anything. In other words, we're helpless. No matter what we try to do to steady the, ourselves, we're, we're helpless. And, I, and then this, this amazing statement, notice verse 20. I, I, I have to imagine so many times, we, we all feel this way. Notice verse 20. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us, from then on all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. And the comfort that I take from this is that as God encouraged Paul to help those individuals that were going through that storm to make it through, we also have God's comfort and his assurances that he also will guide us and help us. And we just want to make some practical applications of how we might be able to do that. What's interesting is one of the things that is said to Paul down in verse 22 Notice in, in Acts 27, verse 22, it says, Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. How could he say this? Well, he says it with such assurance and such certainty, because it's, God told me. God has promised. God wants you to know that he is going to be with you, and he promises you, guarantees you, no one here is going to die. We're going to make it safely. Only the ship's going to be a casualty. Now, yes, we're going to lose the ship. Be prepared for that. But you are going to survive. I think sometimes maybe that's something that maybe we can take courage in. Maybe the, what we need to recognize is that sometimes uh, there are going to be things about us that maybe uh, we cannot uh, we cannot always be certain just the, th the physical things around us and how those things might be able to uh, hold their place, but we ourselves are assured that we can make it safely. And God gives that assurance. 
And notice in verse 25, it says, Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on a certain island. So he gives this assurance. He, he comforts some of these words. That, no, don't worry. You're going to make it safely. Everybody here is going to be alive. Rest assured again. He says, take courage. You are going to survive. Now, something happens. And Paul notices what happens next. A bunch of the sailors start deciding, you know what, it's getting pretty bad out here, and we're going to drop a little, a little boat here, a life raft, and we're going to jump in, and we're, we're getting out of this boat. And Paul says something interesting. Paul goes to his commanding officer and he says, I, wanna, I want you to know what these guys are doing, and I'm going to tell you, if those guys get off the ship, none of you are going to be alive. And they were, what? Why would he say that? Didn't he just say everybody's going to be alive? He just said, God told you, God promises, God assures you. He told me to tell you, you are all going to be alive. But then he sees these sailors jumping ship. He says, if they get off this ship, none of you are going to make it alive. How do we make sense of that? What we make sense of is what those sailors did when they stayed on the ship and what God needed those sailors to do to ensure his promise would be true. In other words, God made a promise, yes, you're going to be made alive, but it was always on conditions that we take action or we are involved, that we do something in compliance with his promises. In other words, there were skilled sailors that were able to navigate and help during that storm. And if those sailors got off the ship, guess what? There's all the skilled people. In other words, God will give us promises. God will tell us certain things are true, but they always have conditions that we are active participants in doing as much as we possibly can do in our obligation of faith. In fact, notice what happens. It says in verse 27, But when the fourteenth night came, as we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. They took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And a little farther on, they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms, fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks. They cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion, and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. In other words, God's promise is conditional that we all do the best we can with what we have while we have it. We must be active participants with God's work. Words, God is just, but you promise, I'm gonna, regardless, you just sit there and just let God do all the work. No, there was something that the sailors were going to be required to do. And we see what these sailors did. Keep reading. These sailors stayed in the boat. Notice it says in verse 32, the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away so the sailors couldn't jump ship and they couldn't get the escape route. So notice verse 39. We see why we needed these sailors. Verse 39 says, when day came, they could not recognize the land, but they did observe a bay with the beach and they resolved to drive the ship onto it if they could. They need to drive the ship. Well, guess what those sailors were doing? The sailors that could drive the ship were trying to jump ship. And, and Paul makes a practical statement. Unless these sailors stay here, God's promise is not going to come true. We need these men because they're the skilled hands that are going to navigate through this storm. So notice what happens. Verse 40. What did they do? Cast off the anchors. They, they left them in the sea while at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudders and hoisting the foresail to the wind. They were heading for the beach, but striking a reef where two seas met, they ran the vessel to ground, and the prow struck fast and remained immovable. But the stern began to be broken up by the force of the waves. If those soldiers that were handling the ropes, hoisting the anchors, lifting the sails, had jumped ship, no one was going to be there to do that. <laughs> words, we have a, a place to play in God's will. It is the contingent on us being proactive and available and obedient. 
We must be willing to do as much as we possibly can. I want to look at another passage, I think, that helps me understand this and make sense of this. Turn over to Psalm 23, a very comforting psalm. A beautiful psalm, a psalm of God's providence and his care and how he promises, assures us that as long as he is with us, he will provide for our needs. And he says, as long as God is with us, we will never be in want. Notice in Psalm 23, one of the most beautiful openings to the psalm. Psalm 23, verse 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want or I shall never be in any need as long as the Lord is with me. Well, then go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we read of the recipients of this promise that these are Christians who have put their trust in God. And God has assured them that as long as they're faithful to the Lord, they will not be in any need. But then we read in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Notice what he says in verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 9 says, Now as to the love of the brethren... You have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands, just as we commanded you. And notice in verse 12, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. When well, Psalm 23 assures us that if the Lord is with us, we will not be in any need. And yet we also see practical things that we must be complicit to also. We must be active. We must be doing what we can, right? In other words, God's promises typically are conditional upon our active willingness to be involved in doing our part. We must be faithful obedient in service. And the reason I bring these things up is I thought it would be fitting in this particular illustration, the idea of Paul making that statement, unless these, these skilled sailors, we need their hands, unless they stay here, this promise of God's assurance is not going to come about because we need them. And that idea of, of being an active participant in what we do is we call upon God's will is uh, in, the, in the bulletin for this morning, this uh, first Sunday of the month, so we have challenges sometimes in there, and the, the challenge for this month was a prayer challenge um, that we might uh, give ourselves to certain areas of prayer, that we might see uh, uh, God opening up avenues where maybe before there haven't been any. That's such a, a wonderful thought, a promise that God gives, that God is able to open up areas where sometimes it seems that we've come across dead ends. And there are three specific areas, praying for one another, praying for enemies or, or uh, negative influences in our life, and also praying for the gospel. And I thought it would be maybe a practical uh, lesson, and, and along with that challenge, that we also encourage ourselves, that we also, as Paul encouraged the sailors on the boat, as Paul encouraged others, when we call upon God and when we rest assured that God is going to help us, let us also be active and be busy and be doing everything we possibly can in condition with letting God direct us and lead us. We recognize that God encourages us to be active. Uh, we turn to James. James uh, uh, builds his whole lesson and his whole point on this premise that faith must have accompanying works of obedience or action that we are complicit, that we're willing to engage in. That's what he says there in James chapter 2, verse 14. He says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself, it's useless, it's pointless, it's vain talk, it does nothing. That's the kind of, that was the point of Paul's emphasis. There's no point in me telling you that God's going to 
see you safely unless the sailors do your job. <laughs> unless we have people that can do this work, that can actually uh, uh, be able to do this. And so I want to just take that application, take that principle, and plug it in those three simple areas where we will hopefully grow in a, that challenge of giving ourselves to prayer in just three simple areas. One, that we might pray for one another. Let us be praying for one another. Let us be uh, observant and, and acknowledging the areas that we are struggling with, the areas that we are have need of. And let us also be willing to also be, be active, to be willing to be available, willing to help, willing to lend a hand if we have the opportunity and if we are able to do so. That's the point he makes in James chapter 2, is what point is it to say that I'm praying for someone if I'm not willing to do something about this, to, to help. Notice if we turn over to 1 John. 1 John also encourages us to have this practical application of our faith and our love that let us always be willing to be having that hand that is willing to work, to, to help, to engage, along with that kind-hearted sentiment of acknowledgement that there is a need. And notice what he says there in 1 John chapter 3. He says in verse 16, he says, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart and knows all things. And that can be a variety of it. And, and, and sometimes maybe the, the, the key area, I believe sometimes this is needed, so that we can see the physical need. So how many times certainly maybe in a spiritual need. You know, in Ephesians chapter 6 where Paul goes through the armor that we put on. And as I'm done suiting up my armor, my obligation is then to recognize that I have no backing armor, and neither do you. And so the term, we've got each other's backs, is something that comes to mind. That we need to have each other's backs, because there is no armor on the back. It's all front. And so the need for us to, to be there for, for one another and hopefully perhaps even have that watchful eye that not only are we praying for one another in certain areas where maybe we recognize that we have need of, of being more vigilant in temptation, but that we can also, as well as the, as the scripture teaches, to be willing to help in whatever way we can. Offer some scripture, offer some encouragement, offer uh, maybe some, some point of reference that has helped you in some way and be able to hand, maybe pass that along and, and be able to find useful. But notice we, that's the context there is that we must also be praying for one another that we might have one another's back. There in Ephesians chapter 6, notice he says there in verse 10, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace in addition to all taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. As he says, we must pray for one another. Let us also, with prayer, have action. Be a willing participant in those prayers. Uh, for me, one of the greatest blessings that has always helped me, uh, it, it, it seems like 
you know, maybe maybe we ourselves, maybe maybe that's why maybe we hesitate to offer it to others because we don't think maybe there's there's maybe much in it. But when you're on the receiving end, I, I love. It's amazing when you get a phone call, or you get a text, and just someone says, "Hey, just checking up on you. How are you doing? Do you, do you need anything? Uh, uh, can I help you with anything?" It, just to know that not only is their prayer, but there's a willingness to say, "What can I do?" And that's really what that principle that Paul is implementing is saying that. It's, it helps when we are in, involved in the process of working together with God. And that's such a blessing that we can offer that for one another. And so when to offer that added element of encouragement, as we do pray for one another, let us also be on standby, on guard, or on willingness to just to offer whatever it is that we can and be willing to be active participants in our prayers for one another. You know, see, did he encourage them to pray together for each other, for our weaknesses, for our struggles? You know, as he says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains and in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You know, one of those things that certainly makes it easy for uh, individuals to speak boldly, and Jesus incorporated that. You know, he talked about the disciples that would go out in hostile environments preaching the gospel, the, the preliminary elements of the kingdom. And then he said, someone who offers you just a cup of cold water will in no ways lose their reward. In other words, that sometimes that prayer accompanied with an offering hand or a gesture of help or assistance that that's such a blessing and does be able to do so much in our growth and our development and our keeping ourselves vigilant against temptation so again let's keep in our minds vigilant to to offer that to one another another area where i think this is awful uh, very challenging for me and certainly has to be challenging for all of us i think when it comes to this point but there's another passage that also encourages us to be active in our prayers and that's also for our our enemies we're encouraged to realize what good is prayer. Sometimes praying, and we think, well, I've done enough. Pray. I don't even have to say this prayer. <laughs> it's enough that I even, I even think about you. But there actually is something else that we are encouraged to be active with, even prayer. And it is also in the same sense to be willing to be involved, to offer help, to offer something, and, and let them know that that prayer is genuine. But notice over in Romans chapter 12, we, encourage, we are encouraged and challenged that with prayer, we find ourselves even in that moment and willingness to offer it for those who need it. Notice what he says in Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And notice verse 20, it says, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So perhaps in a certainly more challenging element of, of action, or something that could be challenging enough just to, instead of having a, a curse in our mouth, to, to, to replace it with a blessing in prayer. But in addition to that, instead of having a hand that's willing to withhold any good, say I'm here and able to offer it with my prayers a blessing and offer uh, assistance as well. And that can be very challenging. But again, let us remember, just as Paul says, we want our prayers to be effective, we must be active participants in what God is calling us and active to do. And finally, one more point. Of course, we talked about praying for one another and our temptations and our struggles, praying for our enemies, praying for those who have uh, discouraged us in some way or, or made life difficult, that we might instead let them know that we are also thinking of them as well, that we are willing to be there to help them with their own struggles.
maybe is the reason why um, they have uh, such a, a negative um, attitude towards us and something we might help them with. But this third area, of course, praying for the gospel, praying for opportunities for the gospel to be successful, praying for opportunities for the gospel to be spread. Of course, of all things, certainly what good can that prayer be unless we also are saying, I want to be active in this prayer. I want to be willing to do whatever I can to help in this area. As we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, remember Paul, remember what Paul said? Paul said, pray for me, pray for the gospel. Well, Paul recognized that, again, he had to be active with those prayers. That when opportunities came, he had to seize them. He had to act upon them. He had to uh, be willing to, to plant that seed and to have those conversations. But notice we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, just he encouraged the brethren to pray for him. And he wanted prayer to be offered that the gospel would have an open course. He said, I have to be active in this. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. He says, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. I said, well, what, what's all this planting and watering stuff? I, I, I thought we, the whole point was praying, praying for the gospel. Yes, praying in our obedient faith, working alongside those prayers. If you go over to Colossians and notice this. No doubt these prayers or these petitions for prayers went right alongside Paul's willingness to say, let's, let's be on the, on the alert and ready to, to help it in any way and be active. In Colossians chapter 1, verse, or excuse me, Colossians uh, chapter 4, 4 and verse 2, he says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been in prison that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. And I, one key point that, that goes alongside that idea of prayer, keep alert. Keep alert. Well, what is it I'm supposed to be keeping alert in? You can always seem to be talking about my, my job. Keep alerting. Well, I've asked God, I've asked God, I've asked God. Well, what's my job? What's my role? What's my responsibility? What's, what's my opportunity? Keep alert in it so that what? That I may then seize upon it. Notice he says, verse 5, there are things that I must do, things I must control, things I must be actively thinking about while I'm engaging in the opportunity. In other words, I can't just uh, be, be just totally giving it to completely to God. I must seek to direct my mouth. Notice what he says in verse 5. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Making. In other words, that's my job. I need to make something of the opportunity God gives. I have to be involved. Make the most of that. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. I thought it was fitting just knowing that that's uh, the... The encouraging challenge for us is the challenge of prayer and hopefully find that maybe be encouraging or useful as we think about areas we can direct our prayers but also to be mindful of just a practical application that we would also also be on the on the alert and on the readiness to be involved and in helping and to keep in mind again that statement that Paul made unless or unless we are involved these promises or these uh, assurances of God may not very well fall through because he is contingent on our willing, obedient action. And of course, one final application of this, certainly we can see this true, is in our need to be saved from our sins. We recognize what good can be crying out for salvation unless I am active in obedience. It's obedience, obedience to the faith. God has provided his part. God has allowed his son to die. God provided the perfect sacrifice. God provided the attitude and the love and the power to reverse the curse of death, to be risen from the dead. But there's something that we must be complicit with the gospel. We must do our part to receive the blessing. And notice that's what comes out there in Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 7, says, In the days of his flesh, he offered up uh, both prayers and supplications, with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, 
he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Notice that obedience is coupled with his prayers. He was offering prayer, but he was also willing to be obedient even in prayer. Let us also follow the same example. He says he was the, that example of obedience that we might also obey him. In verse 9, the source of eternal salvation. So if anyone here has a need to take advantage of what God has provided through the sacrifice, through the power of redemption by the blood that was spilled by Jesus on the cross and the, the comfort of knowing that there is, uh, there is life after death, Take full advantage of your opportunity in faith to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that in faithful obedience you submit to baptism, to be buried in water for the forgiveness of your sins, that you might walk to rise in newness of life. And all of us together, as we seek to be faithful to the Lord, let us also, as we call upon God for help, as we call upon God for His assurances, as we call upon Him to lead us, to teach us, to, to strengthen us, let us also continue to be obedient in our part as our walk of faith must be consistent and active and willing to comply with where God would have us to go. So whatever your need is, if you need to obey the gospel, we encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity. We're going to stand and sing a song of encouragement. Won't you come to the front and obey the gospel while we stand and sing the song together?